Hello and welcome to the very first Reminds Time Send I Ask Q&A series. Um, this is part one and we will be talking about all things SEN support. Um, as I said, this is the very first um, series of this kind. Um, so if there are any technical difficulties, do forgive me. Um, I am recording it um, in my own time. So hopefully I can get a smooth take, but we'll see. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself. So my name is Chloe Como. I'm an advisor with Southampton Send IS. And so I'll be taking you through some of the questions supplied today by the lovely Reminds members and providing you with some key information, guidance and legislation to support some of those answered. So hopefully it will give you um, not just some advice, but also some information to take forward that you can look into further. Um, perhaps that you can use yourself to support the conversations you may need to have with the school or with the local authority. So as I said, part one is on all things SEN support. So we're starting kind of at the beginning in a way. So I'll take you through a number of these questions and we'll have four parts over the summer, all on different topics. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about SendIS and who we are. So hopefully you will be aware of our service. Um, we are growing year on year, and I think most SEM parents in Southampton are aware of us, but some may still not know 100% what we do or what support they can access. So our name first stands for um, Special Educational Needs and Disabilities Information Advice and Support Service. Um, which is a bit of a mouthful. So I'm pleased we've got an acronym that works. So we are the Send I Ask team. Um, so we're a free impartial service um, supporting families with a Southampton postcode. And um, we also provide advice to professionals who might be supporting families. And we work collaboratively with those professionals and families. Um, and then as a service, we provide factual information around SCN law, um, impartial advice and guidance as well. So, sorry, my slides are a bit delayed. So that gives you an overview of who we are and what we do. So here are some of our contact details. Um, so this is for the Southampton team um, here at Rose Road, where we're based. We do also run the Portsmouth, Sendias and West Bucks. Um, but as I said, I work for Southampton and I know Reminds is primarily for Southampton parents. Um, but if you do need any other details, just do a quick search or look on the local offer. Um, but as you can see, you can reach us by phone. We have a helpline open Monday to Friday during work hours, um, email address, uh, we have a website and we're also on Facebook. So if you just search for Southampton Send IS, um, like our page, you can talk to us on Facebook chat. Um, we post regular kind of uh, events, updates, resources through Facebook as well. So do have a look on there. So let's get started. So question one, what support can I expect if my child doesn't have an EHCP, so an education, health and care plan? So this question is asking about SEN support or support provided by schools for pupils without an EHCP. So let's start by talking about what SEN support is and when it is necessary. So as it says here, SEN support is help that is additional to or different from the support generally given to most of the other children of the same age. So it's funded by the school's own resources, essentially. So all schools will have universal forms of support um, that may take place in a whole school or whole class approach. So those strategies that they use for everyone, regardless of SEN or, or need of any kind. Um, this becomes SEN support when it is additional to or different to that universal level. So when it's more individualised to the child's needs. So in terms of funding, schools receive funding to support pupils at a universal level, as we just discussed. So this is based on the number and age of children at the school. Additional resources for children or young people with SEN are provided through the school's SEN national budget, which the government suggests is up to around £6,000 per child. So there's a link to a really useful um, Southampton City Council document that explains the levels of, su of SEN, um, support expected and relevant funding. Um, so it will come up in a few slides. I'll, I'll point you to that in a second. Um, so all schools should have a clear process of identifying and responding to SEM uh, through regular assessment and review. 
So if your child has been identified as having SEN, the educational setting should let you know and involve you in discussions around what support might be required. So SEN support should take what is called a graduated approach, following regular assess, plan, do, review cycles. So I'll go into that a bit more in a second just to explain what that is. So assess, plan, do, review. So this is a cycle, as I said, that should take place regularly. It's a process that is part of the graduated approach to SEN in schools. Um, so we'll start with the assess stage. So this process should involve a clear analysis of the child or young person's needs from the class teacher with the support of the school SENCO. This should draw not only from the, the child's progress and their kind of academic or attainment levels, but also the class teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, the class teachers observations and assessments um, and any information from the school's own approach to attainment and progress. Assessment could also draw on opinion from professionals, so where they're involved, so an EP, for example, or any other relevant professionals. Um, it should also draw on the child or young person's development relative to normative data, so to the norms of peers their own age. So how does that child or young person match up? And then finally, it should also include assessment of the child's own views and parental concerns. So that's a, a vital part of it. So the next stage is the plan stage. So the parents should be formally notified if the school decide to provide SEN support, although, as we've just said, parental concerns should be part of the assessment stage. So parents hopefully should already be involved and aware at this stage. Adjustments should be planned and agreed by the, teach, the teacher, the class teacher, um, the SENCO and the parent. A clear date for review should be set, as well as measurable targets and expected outcomes. So the plan itself needs to have a specific outcome or outcomes that it's working towards. Um, so that may be through a number of targets or expectations that the child should be meeting. So the next section, <clears throat> excuse me, is the do section. So the class teacher would be responsible for the day to day um, basis of the majority of support. Um, however, the SENCO should also support the class teacher with any additional assessment or changes. Um, any staff that work close, uh, sorry, excuse me, any staff that work closely with the child or young person, um, potentially outside of the classroom, should also work with any of the other staff involved, so class teacher and SENCO. So there should be this kind of seamless um, support going on and everyone should be um, on the same page essentially with what support is going on, what progress is being made, etc. So it's that continuous process. And then finally, the review stage. So regular reviews of the pupils' progress and the effectiveness of support or interventions should take place. Um, so the school should meet with parents at least three times a year, um, and that's taken from the SEND code of practice. So it's uh, guidance for schools, um, which works out, I guess, at once a term. Um, so there may be times when it's appropriate or necessary to meet more than this amount um, and that can of course be discussed with the school SENCO. So um, a little kind of personal anecdote I guess, um, I've supported families where they meet with, um, with the school SENCO to review progress kind of once a month. Um, of course it depends on availability but for that particular child that I'm talking about, reviews needed to be um, more regular, I guess, um, to closely monitor the progress. So there can be some flexibility, but the SEND code of practice does suggest or advise that parents meet at least three times in the school year. So let's go back to the question here. So what support can you expect without an EHCP? So we're talking about what duties does the school have in terms of support? So nursery schools and colleges have clear duties under the Children and Families Act, this so specifically section 66. So you'll see the full quote here. I won't read all of it. I'll leave you to read that in your own time. But what that um, specific piece of legislation is, is saying is that schools have to use their best endeavours to secure provision for the child to support their needs. So this includes making reasonable adjustments um, in the school day. And that's taken from the Equality Act, that phrase, reasonable adjustments. 
Um, and those reasonable adjustments can be anything that enable your child or young person to access the learning. So that could be um, seating arrangements, so sitting them closer to the teacher um, or away from distractions. That could be adjustments to writing or reading materials, so maybe enlarged font or um, chunked reading or something like that. Um, it could be something more specific to their needs, so maybe having movement breaks or sensory breaks. So any adjustments um, that are considered reasonable to allow your child or young person to access the school day and the environment as well. So I think the the main thing or one of the main things here is that there's no one size fits all with SEN support um, as it should be tailored to the child's individual needs. It's needs led based on the child's SEM, their special educational needs. So examples or potential examples of support that is additional to or different from what's generally provided might include a specific um, plan for the child, an IEP. So that would detail their needs and what supports in place and their outcomes. It might also include access to small group work. So maybe if a child um, is struggling a bit more academically, um, sometimes schools might have those breakaway groups, so smaller groups where they get a bit more support with the, with the curriculum. It might also include uh, extra time or support with the class teacher, with the TA or with an ELSA. It may also include, as we said, adjustments to materials or equipment. So as I said, kind of writing materials, maybe um, a special writing pen or something like that. It also could include um, access to specialist advice or support. So, for example, the, the educational psychologist service, so an EP, um, and they might be available to give more, uh, a more thorough picture of your child's needs um, and to advise the school how best to support them. This process should also include measurable target settings so that your child's progress can be measured and reviewed. So um, it's great if there is SEN support in place, but how do you measure the progress of that if there are no targets set? So that is a key part of SEN support. So you're working towards a target. If your child or young person does not meet the target, um, why is that? Is it because the support isn't enough or isn't right? So that's a really crucial part of it there. So you can read more about the SEM provision specific to your child or young person's uh, school or setting in their SEN information report. So that should be in their policy section on the website. Um, if you can't find it there, do look at the uh, local offer. So the Southampton City Council local offer um, will have a list of schools and there should be a link to that SEND information report there. She says, hopefully. I know when I've looked recently, there are they are there. So fingers crossed, that would be a good way to access it. Um, I'd also say as well, speak with your school senko. So that that person, her role, his or her role is to oversee that SEM support. So they're a, a crucial member of staff for you to have a conversation with. So if you have any concerns or questions, do speak to them. Um, they're best place to answer your queries and to put additional support in place if necessary. If you would like further information around SEN support, um, we will be talking about it throughout, but there will be some links later on in this presentation um, to some fact sheets and presentations that SendIS have provided. So do look out for those. Um, and as ever, do get in touch with SendIS or with any other services, even with, with Remind, um, if you do want some advice or guidance around this. There we go, I've included some links here. So as I said, there's a link to um, send I ask fact sheets, that first one there, to the parent training course we delivered in the autumn term of 2020. Um, so that's been kind of re-recorded and pre-recorded, so you should be able to access that there. Um, links to the Ipsy website, which is a, a great kind of fountain of knowledge there for all things SEN. So I definitely recommend having a look on there. Um, I've got a link to the Southampton City Council local offer here. So this is the schools list. So fingers crossed if you're looking for any of those um, SEN information reports, you'll be able to find them there. This is the, the next one is the link to the graduated approach. So um, levels of SEN and the funding and support expected that I mentioned earlier. 
Next, I've got a link to the SEND code of practice that I've referenced. So specifically chapter six, which is um, around schools. So it talks about SEN support and what is expected. And then in terms of legislation, we've got the Children and Families Act here. So um, the best endeavours duty we mentioned, section 66 and section 34 to 35, which is around children without an EHC plan and in a mainstream education. So that's especially relevant to this, this first question here. And then finally, we've got the Equality Act, um, section 20, and that is where you'll find the reasonable adjustments duty. So on to question two. So I'll read it out first. So my child didn't get a diagnosis after assessment, but all the issues that prompted us to refer are still there. Schools say without a diagnosis, they will not put in additional support. What can I do about this and what can I expect? So this answer is similar in some ways, but I guess a little bit more specific. But simply put, schools do not need a diagnosis to put support in place. So schools approach and also local authority approach should be needs led, meaning they are dynamically assessing the child's needs as well as their strengths and putting support in place to target those needs. Um, so there's no requirement for a diagnosis to put support in, in place. So again, I've, I've emphasised it here. So SEN support is needs led, not diagnosis led. Um, so this should be delivered through that assess plan do review cycle we talked about already. Um, there's no one size fits all support plan for a child with an ASD diagnosis. Um, therefore, having a diagnosis shouldn't prevent this particular school from putting support in place. So I would if I was if I were this parent, um, listen to this this presentation in full, of course, but have a look at some of the, the resources and legislation. And if, if appropriate, maybe take that to the school um, and say, you know, I've I attended or I viewed um, this Q&A session and the advice given is that, et cetera, et cetera. So you can use, use the guidance, use the legislation referenced here to support you in your conversations. Uh, so yeah, my suggestion would be go back to the school, um, discuss it with, the sink of it further, um, maybe think about some of these questions I've, I've put here. So what support is currently in place, if any? What impact is this having? When were the support targets or progress last reviewed? And have the school sought external advice? Um, and again, yeah, do use the links um, in the previous slide to kind of back up, I guess, what you're saying. Um, I again emphasise that none of the guidance or legislation states that a diagnosis is a requirement for accessing SEN support. So <clears throat> I'm not sure if, if maybe the, the school have misinterpreted some legislation or some advice somewhere, um, but that is absolutely not the case. Um, so these conversations can be tricky, sometimes a little bit intimidating, um, especially if not, you're not used to having these conversations. Um, so if you do need support having the discussion, having a meeting, please do get in touch with SendIS. Um, we do meeting support um, depending on what you require. So that could be a conversation beforehand to help you prepare, could be attending the meeting with you, um, kind of taking minutes and obviously appearing as an impartial um, professional to give factual information about the law. So we would talk about the things I'm talking about here. But yes, do get in touch if you need that support. We'd be more than happy to advise or support however we can. So on to questions three and four. So I've grouped these two together um, because they are fairly similar in some ways, but I will look at them separately. So if we start with question three, um, so it's a scenario where the child has a diagnosis, but the school are not acknowledging the problems. Let me read it out first. So my child has an autism diagnosis, but school don't see or acknowledge any problems. When my child comes out of school, he often melts down. What support can I ask for in school? So this is a very 
common, I guess, common query that we, we receive within our service. Um, so it's this kind of difference of, in opinion uh, between home and school or difference in observation, I should say, rather than opinion. Um, so where the school might report that the child is happy or seems fine at school, but at home parents or carers are seeing a very different picture. Um, it may even be on the way home or on the way to school. So it's not necessarily just at home. Um, so this talks about, I guess, the Coke bottle effect, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so when a child or young person might be holding in all their difficulties throughout the day, and I've put here as my first question, could it be a result of masking? Um, holding in all their, all their needs and difficulties, um, maybe to just assimilate to their surroundings, maybe because they're not comfortable expressing themselves at school. They don't want to be different. They don't want to out themselves as different or struggling. There could be a whole host of reasons. But in keeping those things in all day, that is extremely stressful. And as soon as that child feels uh, they are in a safer space um, with someone they're more comfortable, feel safer, that kind of that fizzed up bottle of coke if you like has to explode at some point and that's that's the coke bottle effect and that's what parents often describe when they come to our service this kind of release of everything um, as soon as they get home or as soon as they leave the school gates so again back to that first question so could it be due to masking could your child or young person have unidentified needs that are impacting them throughout the school day and those might be needs that you're aware of or maybe you're not aware of it could be that school aren't aware of it either because your child is so adept at masking so if you do have some theories about what those difficulties might be maybe your child has expressed them to you or through observations at home um, I would say have a conversation with the school and ask them to look into those areas of needs in more detail. So that could be through um, a class teacher or the Senko observing the, the child um, in a whole class situation, just keeping an eye on them, maybe looking for any potential triggers. Um, could involve a conversation with the child, depending on, on how sensitive they are to those, those kind of conversations. Um, it also depends on the reason behind your child or young person's meltdowns, um, but this support could be in the form of um, perhaps in including movement breaks. So if, if you're not quite sure what, what is um, triggering, triggering your child or causing your child difficulty in the school day, but you know that they, um, they struggle with attending or sitting or, or whatever for, for long periods of time and they need to move around, what what support could be in an example of support that could be put in place is a movement break, a regular movement break. Um, maybe it could be put into their timetable and that gives them two minutes to release energy, um, move around, and then they can come back and focus on the task at hand. So that's just an example. It could also be sensory breaks or um, a kind of downtime. So five minutes again at the end of each task where they can just um, have their downtime, regulate themselves and then go back to whatever. So support can look very different. It depends on the needs of your child. Um, so again, I'd suggest opening up this conversation with the Senko. So they're the kind of gatekeeper, if you like, to this SEN support. Um, if you need further support at home, um, as is often the case, because this can be really difficult for families, um, your child or, or young person's meltdowns might be violent or aggressive. So if you need support at home, there's absolutely no shame in admitting that. And there are services available to support you. So um, there's an early help team within Southampton City Council Children's Services. Um, they're not social workers, but they are support workers, family support workers um, who can support you in identifying areas of need at home and finding you support within the city, so within their resources. So they can be really helpful. If you do feel you need that level of support at home, um, schools or other professionals can make referrals. So um, we as a, as a service, we as professionals can make a referral if needs be. Okay, so 
I'll go up back to, sorry, question four, because I didn't read that out. Um, there aren't any issues at school during the day, but getting her there is really difficult and we sometimes end up in dangerous situations. Can school be expected to help? So um, again, you can see it's quite similar in some ways. It talks about um, this, this child or young person um, being fine or appearing fine in the school day but the journey to school being quite difficult. Um, and that can sometimes be an indicator of, of this, this kind of difficulty in the school day. If the child is maybe feeling anxious or apprehensive about going to school, it means the journey there can be really difficult. So to me, that suggests that there may be a potential area of unidentified needs there that needs exploring. So I would say the same, same advice applies. Um, I think the school can absolutely be expected to help. So um, it's absolutely your right to express your concerns and ask the school to look into your child's needs more to see if there are any areas that they're struggling with that might be um, causing this kind of behaviour in the morning. Um, especially if it's leading to dangerous situations, um, there's plenty that the school can do to support you with this. So it might, um, might include obviously assessing need, as I said, and looking if there are any other areas. It might be making changes to that morning routine to accommodate your child's difficulties. So perhaps starting earlier or later to avoid crowds, if crowds might be a trigger. Um, that's just one example, but there are plenty of things that can be put in place. It's just about having that conversation with the Senko and seeing what support can be offered. OK, so I'll go on to question five now. Um, so this one says, can I insist upon speaking to an educational psychologist? When should I be asking for EP involvement? EP stands for educational psychologist. So in the first instance, it would be best to have a conversation with the school around EP involvement. So all schools in Southampton have a link EP who provides advice and support to the school and, and the pupils on role there. So the EP service is, is part of um, the local authority, so Southampton City Council's wider children's services team. So when should you be asking for EP involvement? Um, so an EP will typically become involved if the school or parent do not feel the child or young person is making the academic or social progress that they should be. So emphasis there on social progress as well. It's not just academic progress. We're looking at the child holistically. We're looking at all their needs, social progress as well. And also that kind of feeds into emotional um, the emotional needs as well. So typically EPs will become involved where strategies have been tried by the school and parents. So there's been that assess plan due review cycle. So strategies have been tried, um, but maybe progress hasn't been made or little progress or not as much as expected. So in short, if you feel your child or young person is not making the progress they should be, it may be a good time to be asking for EP involvement. So I've taken this quote here from the EP service page on the local offer. So just this is, I guess, a, an informal criteria that they've written. So in order to access our service, children need to be presenting with significant difficulties that the school or education setting feel they cannot meet from within their own resources and therefore feel that independent advice is needed to help them better understand the issues and to develop an intervention plan. So this kind of goes back to that SEN support. So within the school's resources, do the school then feel actually we're not fully understanding this child's needs, we're not fully supporting them? Um, and do we need that external support, that independent advice? So then um, in terms of who can request this EP involvement, so they can be accessed by your child or young person's school, as I said, all Southampton schools will have a link EP who can be consulted with informally and formally for advice. So um, informally, I know that the EP service have a kind of, oh, I can't remember what the name is, but an informal service where um, class teachers actually can discuss a child anonymously and get some informal advice which is really helpful. Um, a, a more formal consultation would involve a referral and then um, an EP assessment if deemed necessary. 
Um, so there may be a situation <clears throat> where you as a parent feel that EP involvement is necessary, but perhaps the school doesn't agree. So perhaps the school feels actually we're meeting this child's needs within our resources and we don't feel that EP involvement is necessary at this point. It, it has happened, it does happen. Um, there also um, recently I've, I've noticed in, in kind of parents reports that schools um, maybe are struggling with uh, an influx, if you like, of children who need more specialist advice or independent advice. So there's perhaps a, a waiting list, if you like, or a, a priority list of children that schools are having to put together. Um, and that means that some parents have been told, actually, your child isn't a priority at this moment, although we do acknowledge they might need EP involvement down the line. So that's just, I guess, an unfortunate um, symptom of the times and, and, and how overstretched services can be. Um, so as I said, there may be a situation where parents don't agree with the school stance on EP involvement. So that does happen and vice versa. Um, so, for example, in, in both the scenarios in questions three and four, there was a clear difference in opinion. So in this case, parents are welcome to contact the EP service themselves, which is brilliant. So they can do that via telephone or email to discuss their concerns. The EP service will then contact the school just for more information and to determine whether they feel EP involvement is necessary. So it doesn't guarantee involvement, but you can, as a parent or carer, contact the EP service and discuss your concerns and then they'll look into it and make a decision. Um, so this also applies for any parents who are home educating. Um, so you can contact the EP service and have a thorough discussion. Um, of course, if you're home educating, there's not an attached school. Um, so the EP service will only talk to you and any other professionals that might be involved. So I've included the contact information for the EP service um, on this slide. So should you wish to find out any more information um, or have a chat with them. So you've got the phone number, email address and the website as well. So that brings us to the end of part one of the Reminds and Send I Ask Q&A series on SEN support. So I hope that this has been helpful. Um, if you do have any further questions or feel you would like support from either Send I Ask or Remind, do get in touch with either of us. Um, so you can get in touch with Reminds via their Facebook page, Twitter or email address or attend their regular events and drop in. So they do um, lots of drop ins and events, um, close links with CAMS as well. So some really good events to look out for there. Um, for more information, just check their website. Um, you can get in touch with Send I Ask through our Facebook page, so Facebook chat, um, email or phone number, all of which were provided on an earlier slide. So that's it for this part. And I hope to see you for part two of the series. So part two will be focusing on EHCP, so quite a hot topic. So hopefully see you then. Take care. Bye bye.